Greetings, welcome. My name is Ryan Nix. I am a Principal Solutions Architect with Amazon Web Services. Uh, joining me here today is Charlotte, who is one of the Red Hat Managed OpenShift Black Belt team members. Charlotte, say hello. Hi everyone, my name is Charlotte Bond, and I'm a Managed OpenShift Black Belt, as Ryan said. Right, so what we have here, Charlotte, is a architecture diagram of the Red Hat OpenShift service uh, on AWS or ROSA and this is a very generic architecture for a public facing uh, cluster. So we've got these entry points where uh, developers, customer administrators or Red Hat's SRE are, are coming in over the internet through a collection of AWS load balancers. And we can see that here on the top of the diagram. I, I want to quickly talk to you about what are some of the resilience factors of OpenShift in itself and how those complement resilience on AWS. Uh, one of the things that you've got in this architecture is OpenShift has a control plane made up of master nodes, uh, and there are three of those. Why three? Why is it always this magical number of three? And, and what happens if one of those control plane nodes has to fail, whether there is something wrong from a software or hardware perspective? Thank you, Ryan, for that question. As you said, we the the basic like the default deployment always comes with three control plane because that's the brain. Like this is what controls your cluster, and you want to make sure that it's always available because if one fails, then you have to to carry over the job of the one that failed. So, so it, it, it's a continuity element. Is there also a quorum decision making process uh, that that's sort of aiding, uh, being aided by there being three? So if one fails, there is no sort of situation of there being a split brain, that failover is facilitated correctly? Um, yeah, it's more about um, just making sure that at least there's a minimum of two, if one does fail, why the cluster is able to spin up or why um, our SRE team is able to detect that there's a failure in one of the clusters, like uh, in one of the control plane, and be able to spin up a third. And so those two can still be able to handle all the API calls that come into the cluster and be able to um, like do whatever needs to be done. And the fact that there's two remaining, you don't see a performance degradation, you don't see any impact to the customer. Uh, in, a, in a traditional OpenShift or a self-managed OpenShift, so if we look at OCP or the OpenShift container platform, the customer would be managing all of this. So the customer would detect this. They would be responsible for correcting that failed node. Even though OpenShift still is continuing to work, you'd still need to fix the failure. With managed OpenShift, that that's not necessarily the case. With, with Rosa, the customer doesn't need to worry about this. That's right, because behind the scenes, uh, SRE are like proactively monitoring your clusters, and once this fails, you won't even notice that there was a failure in one of your control planes, because the team, like your, the SRE team that manages the clusters, would spin up another one for you. Okay, so this is more a case of I'm not being paged in the middle of the night, I'm not needing to react to tickets, I'm coming back to work and getting an email that states there was this event, these are the actions we've taken and, and have a pleasant existence. That's correct. And, and that's exactly what I as a business owner hope for. I want to shift to the, uh, the, the infrastructure layer, or more, most importantly this router. This, this router layer that we have over here uh, this is facilitating how my customers get to the actual application workloads. So my customers are coming in through a collection of load balancers, they get to the router layer, and that router layer routes traffic to my worker nodes where my pods or my applications would be running. What happens if a router fails? So let's, for example, blow up this one. Uh, how does that function from an OpenShift resilience perspective? Um, so when a router fails, and that's why we have like the two infra nodes to, uh, to account for the high resiliency, such that if one router fails, traffic is automatically routed to the other, and that also gives our SRE time 
to spin up another because this is still managed for you. So you really don't get to know that there was a failure. And then um, there's the second infra that gets spun up for you and takes over. So usually when one fails, everything gets routed to the other one that's still up and running. And then you really don't get to feel the impact of that. And, and, and configuration wise, the registry, the route and the monitoring layers, they're actually a lot simpler than the etcd or the actual controllers. So these are even easier and faster to replace should something fail. Uh, I would argue that infrastructure teams could probably replace these within in a few minutes with the automation that they have at, at, uh, at their hands. If we take this architecture and we take what OpenShift is bringing and we combine that with AWS, uh, am I correct in saying we would take AWS's multi-AZ constructs and spread these across multiple availability zones? So put one control plane node, one infrastructure node into each AZ as such. You are absolutely correct. So this deployment that we have here is just the default, as we said at the beginning, for anyone that wants to get started. But for your production, we highly recommend that you make use of the multi-AZ deployment, which helps you, like, helps you spread out your resources in three different availability zones, which accounts for high availability, high resiliency, fault tolerance, such that if one AZ is down, you still have the other two AZs up and running, and you don't really notice any effect. And as you said, you have one control plane per AZ, one infra node per AZ, and one worker node per AZ, which is like the minimum. Okay, and, and uh, these availability zones, they are the closest construct that AWS has to a physical data center. They're, they're not actually data, se data centers, they're collections of physical buildings, but they're the closest construct we have to a physical data center. So what you're actually saying is you're taking that OpenShift cluster and you're making sure that there are control infrastructure and work nodes spread evenly across separate physical data centers. So if I compare this to an on-premises environment, it's like me having three distinct data centers protecting against failure. And really we've got the open shift availability constructs complemented by the AWS availability constructs. Quickly shifting to the actual worker nodes or the compute work, uh, locations. This is where the applications are running. Uh, these are a little bit more disposable. Um, if, if one of these had to fail, my expectation would be that Kubernetes would detect that and try and move the workloads around. Uh, OpenShift also has the ability to deal with that, not just from a Kubernetes workload perspective, but also from an infrastructure perspective. We've got a, a, an auto-scaling mechanism built into OpenShift. How does that work? Um, so, um, with the auto scaling, when you do deploy your cluster, you have the option of uh, enabling auto scaling, and you, you you set a minimum number of worker nodes that you want, which would be like two, at least two for a single AZ deployment, and you can have more than two for a multi AZ deployment, and then based on what your limits are for your auto scaling, um, when your workload begins to increase. OpenShift or Rosa will be able to detect that you are getting uh, more pots being spun up and then it's going to automatically scale up um, your worker nodes and it could be based on CPU or whatever metrics you set for your scaling and it will scale that up to you, the desired amount that you want up to the max. And once the workload begins to decrease, it would also sense that and scale down automatically to your minimum. So we have two things that are working in combination here. We have the um, Kubernetes uh, pod scaler, which is managing the workloads on the nodes and moving them around, creating additional pods. And that is working in combination with, uh, I believe it is the machine, machine yeah. sets. And 
And these machine sets are doing two things. They're scaling the compute for when we need more compute, when there's more resources required, but they're also facilitating a recovery or resilience model that if we lose a node, it will launch a new compute node or a new a a AWS EC2 instance. And once that new instance comes online, then the pod autoscaler will then shift workloads to that uh, balancing out the workload. So again, we've got uh, that resilience mechanism of open shift from a application or a pod perspective combined with the infrastructure side coming through from that machine set. And this is all in a single region taking advantage of open shift and multiple availability zones and scaling constructs. Uh, Charlotte, thank you for joining me. As always, a fantastic pleasure to work with you. And thank you for joining us here.